everyone. We're going to get started. So I'm Tara Hahn, and I'm the PGY1 on ophthalmology this core month. Um, and our first uh, speaker is Tyler Anderson, coming from Virginia Commonwealth, and he is presenting implications of popular eye remedies for past infections. Good morning. <coughs> so uh, this morning I'm going to talk about, as it says, uh, popular eye remedies. I'm going to focus mostly on over-the-counter products. Uh, this is, I'm pulling this from some research I published this summer. Obviously our time is short, so we won't go into too much detail, but uh, I feel like understanding what types of products are for sale and especially advertised heavily to our patients uh, will help us because we're inevitably going to get questions. The over-the-counter eye, eye care market was almost a billion dollars last year, and that number doesn't include home remedies, herbal remedies, homeopathic remedies. Um, the advertising is relentless. Peop our patients see commercials and uh, billboards and things like that, and inevitably we're going to get questions. Um, I feel like a useful way to, to understand uh, in context what's for sale today is to kind of learn a little bit about where we've come from and where things were 100 years ago. Uh, this is a, a newspaper advertisement for a very popular product uh, from about 1916 and at least 1922 called Bon Opto. And this advertisement was uh, it found in periodicals around the country, very popular at the time. And they, uh, they promised some pretty miraculous results for their little eye water. Uh, it's guaranteed to strengthen eyesight 50% in one week's time in many instances. Uh, Many who once wore glasses say they have thrown them away, and, and there's also some dire warnings about those who don't take care of their eyes, um, and the implication is that this product can help prevent those horrible outcomes. So either things have changed uh, in the advertising realm, or we've forgotten some of the miracle ingredients that they used to use, because obviously we don't make promises like this anymore. Uh, this is a list of uh, popular products of about 100 years ago. Um, I got this uh, list by uh, using the Library of Congress newspaper periodical um, archives. They digitized thousands of newspapers, and uh, these products were for sale in at least m multiple states for multiple years. Uh, the database ended in 1922, so some of these may have been for sale f uh, for a longer time, but um, these products <laughs> were... <laughs> Uh, the table might be a little hard to read, but uh, they contain some very interesting ingredients. There's another pair of advertisements at the bottom, again, promising uh, relief from virtually any eye complaint that you can imagine. Uh, Lavosic over here on the right was very proud of their eye wash uh, thing that was included. Um, I highlighted some of the interesting ingredients here. Uh, <laughs> at least three of the popular products contained mercury. Um, couldn't find any recent clinical trials on applying mercury to the eyeball, but uh, <laughs> it's generally considered a, a dangerous uh, compound even as a skin ointment based on research done in the early 1900s. Um, morphine was popular. Uh, quinine was actually directly poured onto the eyeball uh, in Christos. Um, there's a lot of plant products, and those these plant products actually, many of them continue to be popular today, although some of these... Uh, are, have since been discovered to be t somewhat toxic. One of them is an insecticide now. Um, zinc products were also <laughs> popular. This is a, uh, a picture of a, um, a papyrus prescription from the first century AD, and it included uh, calamine as one of the core ingredients of an eye care product. And calamine is a, is a zinc oxide compound that uh, has been popular for hundreds of years, and many of these products contain zinc. I didn't highlight them here. Boric acid, also popular, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, there's been some changes over the last 100 years, obviously. In 1912, an amendment uh, began the crackdown on some of these false therapeutic claims, although enforcement wasn't very strong until the thalidomide tragedy in the 1960s. That's when things really changed. Um, and now, today, advertisements are generally uh, milder. Um, they don't promise the, to be able to throw your glasses away in a week. Uh, and this is the type of things that our patients see often, and um, the, the general nature of the advertisements um, 
lends itself to questions that we might receive. Uh, this is, these are just pictures of some of the products that I identified that are popular today. I uh, looked at the four biggest retail pharmacies, which is uh, Walgreens, CVS, Rite Aid, and Walmart, and identified products that are for sale in all four of those, and I threw out uh, contact lens cleaning solutions and also uh, there's many of these products have multiple formulations like red eye or nighttime uh, and I this is a, a table of basically those that are just the core basic uh, formulation of each of these brands and many of the ingredients and I'll, I'll actually just highlight some of the things from this table here on this page uh, the many of the modern products today uh, still contain boric acid as a matter of fact the majority contain boric acid which is uh, uh, I'll talk about it in a moment. Many of them contain preservatives, and although many of us recommend preservative-free uh, products, the majority of the, the core basic formulations today can still contain these preservatives, either benzalkonium chloride uh, or some newer preservatives. Chlorobutanol is also an older one. Um, they are salt solutions, and then again, I mentioned the, the different formulations, and these are the things that patients might ask us about. The red-eye formulations with alpha blocking, um, compounds, itch relief formulations with uh, antihistamines, nighttime formulations again with creams or ointments. Um, there's several that have the advanced or ultra or something like that. It's a higher concentration of active ingredient. Uh, cooling formulations have camphor or menthol. Um, and then preservative free formulations, which I, I think are important to talk about. Uh, preservatives obviously are used to, pre to um, inhibit microbial contamination. Um, they've been used for a really long time. Uh, it, unfortunately, many of them uh, damage the, uh, barrier dis the barrier function of the corneal epithelium, um, especially when applied in high concentrations many times a day. And for that reason, uh, many caregivers uh, recommend preservative-free formulations. Uh, these are some less known uh, but n becoming popular preservatives. Uh, like purite, and uh, there's not very much data on these, but it appears that they also c do cause some um, cytotoxicity to the corneum. So preservative-free products virtually all contain boric acid, which actually serves as a preservative in that it inhibits uh, microbial contamination and is a buffering agent. Boric acid is something that was popular 100 years ago, it's still popular today, it's mined in uh, Nevada and uh, or at least the borax and sodium borate is mined in Nevada in the California deserts. And um, it, both sodium borate and borax, or and uh, boric acid, have been found to still cause some corneal epithelial damage, um, even at the concentrations found in ICAR products. Uh, but it's it's generally less than other preservatives. Uh, I wish I had time to learn more about and talk more about popular home and herbal remedies. It's a really interesting uh, topic and there's plenty of interesting cures out there that are popular. Um, the research is pretty scant on most of these, but these are some of the more common things that are recommended on popular websites. Uh, various honey solutions where you dilute honey and either drink it or pour it on your eye. Um, some people recommend breast milk for conjunctivitis and other applications. Um, obviously, warm compresses might be less controversial in some uses, but other people recommend them for things that normally we wouldn't. Cold compresses, just applying potato slices to the eye. And then these are a pair of herbs that uh, were popular 100 years ago in many of those products, also popular for hundreds of years before then, and continue to be popular as herbal remedies today. And the research on those is, again, pretty scant or uh, conflicting. Um, homeopathy, also something I, I wouldn't pretend to know a ton about, and the research is, um, again, scant and conflicting. The, the principle behind homeopathic cures is treatment with similars, uh, basically a super low concentration of something that causes the same symptoms that you're trying to treat. Um, and there's many, many different compounds recommended for virtually every eye complaint I could uh, think of. Interestingly, similacin, which is a, a homeopathic product, is for sale in virtually all pharmacies today, um, and it contains some very interesting <laughs> product or compounds at, at extraordinarily low concentration. So it has belladonna, which is uh, the toxin from Deadly Nightshade, um, at an extremely low concentration. This is the, the uh, toxin that atropine is derived from. 
Um, and it also, simulation, contains mercury. They, they don't really define what mercurius, sublimita mercurius sublimitus means, but uh, the, the concentration is very low, presumably much lower than the mercury that was uh, in the products 100 years ago. Um, I, I really enjoyed learning about some of these things, and there's a, there's a lot more to learn about. Uh, I'd, I'd like to thank Dr. Leffler uh, at VCU and also my friend Jared Donaldson. They helped me edit this and, and get it published. Um, does anyone have any questions? Great, thank you.